Today is the third of four messages in our Transparent Church series. And the title of my message today is called Transparent Friendships. And the first thing I could say about transparency is that I'm not very good at it. Some people are better at it than others, and I'm the one of the ones that's not very good at it. And I think there's several reasons. One could be I'm, I'm, natu- I'm naturally introverted, and uh, I'm a shy person by nature. That, that may be because I moved around a lot when I was a child. My dad was in the oil field, so we, we moved, like, literally every year. So I was the kid all through elementary, even up to high school, where we'd move to a place And I'd be settled for, like, that school year. And right when I was starting to make friends, like, we'd bounce. And then I was, like, constantly the new kid everywhere we went. And so I kind of developed kind of a shy uh, nature. And um, I think maybe another reason is fear. You know, some people just kind of, like, fear. Like, if you really know me or what I'm struggling with, you're going to withdraw from me. And um, I'm not sure who I can trust. I kind of trust issues anyways. And so, it, you know, I'm more of a private person by nature. And some people are like, well, you get up at the pulpit. You can do all that. Well, th- that's a gift from God. It's not natural. Because I'm naturally like the guy at the party that just wants to sit in the corner and be like, peace. <laughs> like, all you guys can talk. I don't like carrying the conversation. Um, I'm just shy and quiet, uh, you know, by nature. But God is doing this work in me where... He's just like cracking this shell open and like making me a person and saying, Josh, you have to be more vulnerable. You have to be more transparent. You got to put yourself out there more. So it's this work he's doing. For instance, like just little things he's doing in my life. Like I'm the type of person that like if my phone rings and we're sitting somewhere among people, I'm going to walk into the other room and have the conversation. Not because it's like a gnarly conversation or anything. It's just I'm private. So I'm going to go like by myself. And like I've, one time I was about to do that and God said, sit down and have your conversation in front of everywhere else. I swear to you, God was like, this is what I'm calling you to do. So I just had this conversation and people were like listening and I got done and there was like a freedom in it. I don't don't know if that makes sense to anyone in this room, but it was like a freedom. And some of you are like so transparent, you're like awesome. Uh, But most people, I think you might be like me where it's like, We keep people at arm's length, and we're not quite sure who to let in our lives. And so today, I want to talk to you about all the aspects and dynamics of personal friendships. You guys ready for that? We're in Romans chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples, that means failures, We ought to bear with the failures of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience, everyone say patience, and everyone say comfort, grant you to be like-minded towards one another according to Christ Jesus. This is not talking about being patient with God, it's talking about being patient with one another. Verse 6, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, therefore receive one another. Everyone say receive. Just as Christ also received us. And that's going to give God glory. It says to the glory of God. And so in this passage, the Apostle Paul, as he's talking about interpersonal relationships in a church setting, he he gives us like four things right off the bat for us to do when it comes to how we treat one another. We're to bear with each other's failures, not judge each other's failures, not withdraw because of failures, but to bear with one another and, and not just do what pleases yourself. 
He also says, be patient with people. Learn how to comfort people. So there's three things. Bear with each other's failures. Be patient with others. Learn how to comfort others. You know, be the person to send a text message with a, with a verse. When someone's on your heart, you don't ignore it. You call them right then and you just obey the Spirit's leading. How are you doing? Hey, let's hang out. You comfort each other. And then lastly, in verse 7, it says, we are to receive one another. The word receive in the Greek is an interesting word. It says to take somebody into your own home. And so it's a God-defined friendship. We like to define our own friendships, and that where, that's where the arm's length comes in. But when it comes to Christian relationships, God says, here's my definition. Friendship is to receive someone into your home because that's when you really start to become friends with someone. You might see someone at church is like, hey, how you doing? Hugs, everything, but you are not coming inside my home, bro. <laughs> but when you have that, when you start opening yourself up like that, transparency takes place. Because people are going to see, oh, like you had to yell at your kids for a little bit. And it's like, that's, that's all good. That's the way God wants it to be. And it's like last Sunday, I, I was invited by some people. I went over to their home and they made the most bomb fish tacos I think I've ever eaten in my life. It was a lot of people in the Spanish ministry. You know, a lot of people were hanging out. And we just had like the best time. And it's like just sharing that time in the home. You see them more. You know, I, I, I see their faces and you just develop that closeness. And whether it's in the home or whether it's out at a restaurant or whatever, this is the kind of thing God is calling us to do and to be for each other. Now, some of our greatest experiences in life happen because of friendships. But on the flip side, some of our most painful experiences happens because of relationships. You know what I mean? You've been there. They're a high risk, high reward sort of a thing. They're scary, but they're rewarding. And when it comes to going to church, a lot of people view relationships as optional. It's, you know, some Christians are like, I came, I opened my Bible, I sang, now leave me alone. <laughs> But the gospel teaches that we were created for friendship. We have a longing inside of us. Even now, some of you are thinking, man, like, you were built to have this longing in your heart because you need people to love on and you need, to love on, they, you need their love back. We're built for it. And Jesus modeled this by being around people. And you see him inside homes a lot. Now, you guys are all Christians. You're Jesus followers. You've embraced the gospel. And as the gospel brings you deeper into God, God then brings you deeper into what he's into, and that is, what is it? People. God's into the people business. That's what he's all about. By nature, you need friends. And it, it doesn't matter if you claim to hate the world you still need a small group of friends to hate the world with. All of us need personal friendships. So today, I'm going to talk about some wrong views, some wrong expectations about friendships, where it can get weird. And then later, I'm going to tell you about some proper views and proper expectations about relationships that can keep it from getting weird. So first, here's two wrong views about relationships, if you're taking notes. Two wrong views about relationships. Number one is to just reject relationships. You keep yourself safe, so you just kind of stay away altogether. Because you hate humans. <laughs> so you separate yourself from them for the most part. Have you ever heard someone who says, I love Jesus, I just don't love church. I love Jesus, I just can't stand his people. Well, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says this, Beloved, 
Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So then they say, well, I'll love people by not being around them, because if I'm around them, I want to strangle them. But then again, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 through 21, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So separation is not the answer. The gospel is the answer. Because the gospel not only restores how we see God and life and ourselves, but the gospel also restores the way we see people. We stop judging people. We stop sizing people up. We stop judging the book by its cover. I want to show you how The Bible describes our friendships with other believers. Please uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And this is just an amazing illustration. It's an amazing analogy God gives to us about how church relationships are supposed to work and how we're supposed to function together. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, We're going to read verses 4 and 5. In verse 4 it says, We're coming to him, that's Jesus, as to a living stone. He's the living stone. He's the chief cornerstone, is what the text will go on to tell us. He's rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, everyone say living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This analogy is amazing. Often, throughout the Bible, it talks about his people being a house. God had the Old Testament temple, but We no longer have a temple because that was just a picture of us. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, the the key piece to it all. It's what you begin and start with. The, The rest of the foundation would be the word of God. Because there is no church, there is no Christian people without the Bible. We didn't know what to do. We wouldn't know what we're supposed to be doing right now if it wasn't for the Bible. But then as you build on this foundation, it's built with people And that's you and me. And so you are a stone. And you are a stone. And we're all supposed to come together. God is not concerned about filling this room. He's concerned about filling our hearts. It's special to God. Because what we're doing right now is supposed to be a little foretaste of heaven. Why do I say that? Because in heaven, God shares with us his eternal desires. If you're like, what does God really want? Well, you see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, all of his people are gathered together, not just off doing their own thing, being like, I'm going to be a Christian all by myself over here in heaven. But we're all together. We're gathered for Jesus. We're looking to Jesus. And it's all about him. And that is the eternal desires of God. And as we come here and we make Jesus our focus, he's greatly pleased with what we're doing, and we become this temple, this house, that he fills all of us together at the same time, and he indwells each one of us. It's beautiful to him. So we're each a stone that makes up the temple of God. But listen to this. This is what I want you to hear. Back in that day, when they made buildings out of stones, they had to fit the stones together. And when they put the stones together, there were lots of little rough edges because the tools weren't perfect and precise back then like they are today. So they would try to eyeball it and they would get as close as they could with the tools they had. But then when you put the stones together, it it wouldn't fit together like it ought to. 
So guess what they had to do to ensure a tight fit? They would take those stones and they would rub them back and forth, back and forth, grind them over one another. And you know what it would do? It would knock off and polish all of those rough edges. My question for you is, do you got some rough edges in your life? You got some rough spots. Everyone say, yeah. yeah. I do too. I got lots of them. And so as we come to church, we're going to rub and knock against each other a little bit. We're going to encounter each other's rough edges and imperfections. And I want you to know that's okay. It's there by design. Because you will never become polished and mature without getting closer to God's people. It's beautiful when you see people in church and they're the totally different personality types. There's nothing that would ever make them hang out together. But because they have Jesus and they've been serving alongside one another, they become great friends. That's supernatural. That's not the work of man. That is the work of Jesus Christ. And it's beautiful. So as you look around this room, you need to know that all of these other people are a part of God's plan for your life. He's even going to use some of them to accomplish his will and plans in your life. So to embrace friendships is to embrace God's will for your life. Isn't it crazy how good we are at coming up with excuses, though? And some excuses are just lame. But then you talk to other people and it's like, oh, wow, like that, that seems like it might be a valid excuse. It's like the person who says, you know, I, I need time to heal because I've just been really wounded. I've experienced a great deal of suffering and loss in my life, and, and I just need to stay away. I just need more time to heal. And hey, if that's you, and you manage to scrape yourself up off the floor, and you're just surviving day by day, and you've made your way here today, I'm very, very, very sorry for the pain that you feel inside your soul. Believe me, I know pain. I get it. I know pain. But please listen to me. Isolation will not heal you. Isolation is the devil's playground. Isolation will not do anything for you. Serving Jesus is how you'll be healed. That's how you'll be healed. Staying away will not be how you get healed. Isolation will only make it worse. I know this. The reason why I'm up here and I'm doing this is because of men of God in my life who did not bail on me, but embraced me and, and learned me and heard my heart and walked with me and encouraged me. I'm here because of men of God, because of friendships, because God using people in my life. I promise you that. And we need to recognize there's other people that hurt and they need us, and they need a friend, they need a hand, they need an encouragement. Is if, you, if as you're sitting here, if God puts someone on your heart that's hurting, it is the Holy Spirit saying, today you need to make a phone call. Today be like Jesus. Today just send them a scripture. I mean, you, you never know, like, hey, how are you? Been praying for you. That might keep someone from suicide today. Because people get low. I mean, people are there feeling like their head's barely above water. And they need encouragement. And then there's the other person who says, well, I've been hurt by a church before or by other Christians. Listen, if you've been hurt by a church before and you hold back because of it, well, nobody has been hurt more by Christians than Jesus. And he does not hold back for, because of it. 
So the hurt Christian has to make a choice. Will I serve and follow Jesus and keep putting myself out there, even though it's risky, or will I serve myself and follow what I want to do, play it safe, and withdraw from people? It depends on who you're following. It depends on who you want to follow. Again, it's a high-risk, high-reward sort of a thing. Praise God, Jesus didn't say, you know what, they're going to hurt me, I'm just going to stay away. Praise God, he did not do that, amen? Amen. James chapter 4 verse 1 tells us, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Friends, the greatest difficulty you'll deal with in the Christian life is not other people, it's your own heart. It's your greatest adversary. And you'll find out what your heart is really like when you have to deal with difficult people going through difficult situations. And so where is your heart at today? As you take this message and you just look inside, where are you at today? Are you going to reject people or are you going to receive people? And if you decide you'll receive people, are you going to make them earn it? Are you going to be the type of person that says, I'll give you some love, but you got to earn it first? Praise God, Jesus doesn't do that with us. Praise God, he doesn't treat us based on how we've treated other people. Will you give love because you do it graciously? Will you extend mercy when it's not deserved? Will you learn to forgive even when they don't ask you for it? That's what the Christian person does. That's what Jesus' followers do. Our biggest problem when it comes to friendships is not other people. It's what's within our own hearts. When I was growing up, when I was a kid, one of my favorite shows on TV was The Wonder Years. Guys, remember that show? Remember Kevin Arnold and Winnie Cooper? Man, Winnie Cooper was really cute when I was like 10. (laughs) And I don't know if you remember Kevin's dad, Jack. Jack is like the typical American male. He would get home with his briefcase and just kind of slam his briefcase down. His his wife would have dinner ready and she'd come, give him a kiss, and she'd say, how's work? And he had the same answer, work's work. And he'd eat dinner and then he'd go watch TV and just escape because of all the stress and all the craziness. You'd just escape and watch TV. And... The thing that the writers of the show were portraying, and there's other dads on TV too, is that Jack and a lot of these fathers in these TV shows don't have friends. Most men don't have friends. I think he represents a lot of men in our culture, faithful to provide, they love their families, but autonomous and an island to himself. Acquaintances, yeah but not really anyone that they can pour their heart out to. They just, they deal with it individually. They can't even share with their wife. They need a man. They need a couple men. Men, you don't need like tons of people just to expose yourself to. Usually men only need a couple, maybe one, two, three, that you can really trust, that you know you're not going to get judged, that you know it's not going to go outside that circle. You need that. Men, you need it. I know I do. And so, I could go on and on and on, but I'll stop. Please just don't reject friendships. And don't reject your friends. That's not God's will for your life. Everyone say number two. The second wrong view about relationships is to worship relationships. So it's, it's clear on the other side of the unhealthy spectrum. It's going too far the other way. And the reason why I say they worship it is because they'll sacrifice anything to get it. And whatever makes you sacrifice for is your God. It's that obsession to belong. 
It starts in an early age. You can see a junior high kid just wrestling so much and not feeling like he belongs. And so he starts to do weird things just to get attention because he worships relationships because it's something that lacks in his life. The obsession to be with another person or the obsession to become part of that certain group becomes a God for them. This is what we call friendship lust. Do you understand? Friendship lust is when there's an unhealthy, weird, it's a weird desire for friendships. Y'all can think about someone, someone in your life, right? Or maybe you, you struggle or you just, it's, it's an unhealthy desire and they overthink it and they say weird things because they're just, they want to belong so bad that they're just not themselves. Which is like, you can just relax and just be you. Be who God's created you to be. And if they don't accept you for you, then get some new friends. Because you'll always be chasing that thing and playing that game and just not being who you are. You know, the reason why some Christians get hurt at church is because they look to the church or at a person within the church to provide something that only God can provide. So here's the lesson. Don't create this idealistic mindset of what you think your friendship should be like. You got to let God create the environment for you. Don't define it for yourself and say, you know, my friends and my community needs to be this and this and this and this and that and that. And what's really happening is it's what you used to have in high school or in college or with a, a unique, you know, your old buddies or where you used to live or something like that. You can't do that because if you're doing that and then you take the chance to enter into deeper relationships at church, you're immediately disappointed and you say, well, this isn't how it was five years ago or 15 years ago. And that's a part of having friendship lust. You're dissatisfied as soon as you walk into the room. And then that will keep you from being used by God for his kingdom and glory while the people you're disappointed in move on with Jesus and with others and end up doing great things for him and have great crowns to lay at the feet of Jesus when they get to heaven. And then the other person's just stuck in the mud doing nothing for Jesus with an idealistic but unrealistic mindset. Have realistic expectations of your church friendships. If you're a new Christian or if you're new to this church, don't get a utopian image in your mind because even though this is a picture of heaven, it's not heaven. And I've had so many people over the years come up to me and say, oh my gosh, this is the greatest church I've ever been to. And I'm like, oh, that's cool, man. How long have you been coming? And they're like, two weeks. All right, well, I just want you to know I'm probably going to let you down next week. I'm probably going to do something. I'm, you're going to think I'm going to be walking to you, but I'm really walking to say hi to someone else, and I did ignore you. I just didn't see you, that's all. And I dis I'm going to disappoint you. And if I don't do it, Pastor Russ will definitely be the one to do it, Okay. <laughs> If you make me or other people the focus of your church experience, you're going to get really disappointed. You know why? God will make sure you get disappointed because you're not looking to him for everything that you need. He will purposefully make you disgruntled. And that's okay because none of us are Jesus. But if coming to church is about you putting all the focus on Jesus. You come for him, you serve him, you worship him, you find your identity in him. You're going to love it here because Jesus is going to be giving to you what no other friend can. And so your other relationships are healthy because his is the most important. He alone is worthy of worship and to make sacrifices for. Amen? So two wrong views about relationships is to reject them and to worship them. I hope that resonates. Let's get into the proper expectations. Here's two, two proper views about relationships. Number one, relationships are messy. 
And if you can just embrace this with all of your heart, you're setting yourself up for friendship success. We need to understand this together because perfection is not required. Perfection is never required for us under the New Testament. The only perfection required is the perfection of Christ. And so you should think of church this way. Think of the church as this massive support group for sinners. (laughs) And even though I'm up here, I'm like, hello, my name is Joshua. And I have been a rebellious sinner since I was three. (laughs) And I got this junk and this junk and this junk. And that's more the realistic mindset, isn't it? You know, a, a general complaint some people have about the church is that it's not transparent. But what they realize is that they are not ready for it. They might talk that talk, but they are not ready for it. Because when you have a friend open up to you and say something to you like, hey, I just want to confess my struggle that, like, I've been watching porn like three to four times a week, and I I just need some prayer. I, I need some encouragement from you. Are you going to be ready for that? Or are you going to be like, I hate transparency. Please stop talking to me. This is uncomfortable. And then the person's like, I was just trying to be real with you and and get some prayer and encouragement with you. And then you know what? The next week, their Jehovah's Witness friend is the one who will sit and listen to him talk for about a half an hour. Are we ready for transparency? We need to be. Because we're not all squeaky clean like we dress on Sundays. You know, one of the funniest things to me is whenever I see... Um, like church advertisements, even church websites. It's, it's all like church advertisements. It's all like beautiful people. It's like hired models. And the poses, they're like this, like, like clean shaven, and they just look pretty. And it's like that's not the church. Like a, a real one, if we wanted to be real, we w- it would just be like a bunch of slobs, and we'd be like, oh, like, oh I need Jesus. Come, come join us, you know. (laughs) Come to our place. (laughs) That's the truth. That's real. And that's okay. There is something so deep embedded in my heart that God's doing right now where I feel like he desperately wants to change the church culture in the United States. Before he can reach this new generation, he's got to change the church. And the emphasis on church culture so long, and this comes from the, the baby boomer generation, which was one of the greatest generations, but one of the byproducts was that church culture became about excellence. Dress your best. Make sure you shave for Sunday. You got to look all nice and everything like that. And, and for so long, throughout the 80s and 90s, nobody wanted any messes at church. It was just, look your best, come. If someone asks you how you're doing, you say, I'm doing great. (laughs) And church is cool that way. We just have to be all polished and clean. Get a bunch of shiny, happy, perfect people in a big, giant, square box and call it a work of God. But there's a new generation that is hurting like like nothing I've ever seen, desperate for Jesus, and they don't know it. And we need to reach this generation. And you know what? This generation could care less about excellence or being polished or giant buildings. They do not care about that at all. They don't care if it's messy as long as it's real. And they don't care about crowds. They they care about being loved for, for who they are, by a, just a small group of people. And so you see them just, they'd rather be with their friends playing their guitars than going and sitting in a cubicle making money. They don't care about making money. It's a different generation. They just want to belong. They want to hang out. They have a different way of seeing things than a lot, than a lot of us. They're more honest about the reality of their lives and their struggles they struggle more with 
gender and identity issues than ever before. They struggle with homosexuality more than ever before. And are we as a church ready and capable of loving these people to Jesus? Because Jesus was, when he was alive, you know, a lot of people were around Jesus for a while and they felt like they belonged and then they believed. Are we willing to be patient with people to, to, to love them and put our arms around them and usher them into the kingdom? Now, of course, Jesus never compromised, but he walked this, this interesting line of balance, of not compromising and sinning, but loving the most you know, gnarly, messed up people and making them feel loved. And so it's okay if church is a little messy. I've come to, I've come to know that. You know, for so many years I, I, I prayed and I, I, I tried to build just this like, oh, we just got this healthy church. And yes, that's great. But what I see is that God wants the ministry and he wants the church. It's okay if it's messy. I think it's to be there by design. I say that because the ministry of Jesus was very, very messy. The training of the disciples was gnarly. I mean, weekly, they were exposed to spiritually and physically sick people. Weekly, Jesus exposed them to people with gnarly bodily smells. He put them in uncomfortable situations like hanging out and talking with prostitutes for long amounts of time. The Pharisees had a much more polished and tidy ministry. You see, you didn't get the mess with the Pharisees. The Pharisees definitely had a ministry that was more comfortable of following. It was definitely more of a ministry where you could just come, look your best, hear some teaching be a little legalistic, and just dip out. And make these Pharisees kind of like they turned into the celebrities of the nation. There's a problem with the celebrity pastor culture. God is not happy with that. Jesus had a messy ministry, full of messy people. And you know what? Because of it, Jesus was... He was routinely criticized, he was falsely accused, he was gossiped and lied about. Everything about it was, even his own family, like, discredited him. His brothers were, like, questioning him and talking down on him. The polished, excellent church wants to hear about God's work in people as long as it's in the past. You know, it's like you meet someone and it's like, oh, you used to be a sinner? Great. Oh, you used to have a messed up life. Awesome. Look what God's done, though. And those things are genuine and real. But can we be a church who goes through the process? Can we be the people in in lives where we hold their hand through the messiness as God is working his story in their lives? Do you understand? Some churches are just not fit for that because it's, it's too messy for them. But in in some of your lives, probably in all of them, when you went from crazy to healthy in your spiritual walk, there were people along the way for you, weren't there? And I want us to be people that can walk with people through their messiness. Amen? Let me show you another reason why friendships are messy. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Like, hashtag, drop the mic, dang. That's heavy. And since the Bible says we have to forgive one another, it implies that we will wrong each other. If you get close to someone or another family, you're going to have moments when they annoy you and you'll annoy them. So if you're just realistic about your friendships, it's going to be great because somewhere along the way, you know in advance you're going to have to say sorry. And you also know you're going to have to forgive. You have to forgive because Jesus commands you to. 
And he says, your sins won't be forgiven if you don't forgive others. And guys, I myself have been wounded by Christians. But God has given me the ability to forgive, hopefully with the same forgiveness that he's forgiven me with. And you know, because I'm human, I've offended people. I've never offended Pastor Russ, though, for the record. (laughs) I've offended people. Maybe someone in this room, you're sitting here and you need to forgive me because you're like, yeah, I remember that one Sunday, you jerk. I was coming to give you a hug and you just walk right by me and it's like, I... I, I, I'm maybe, I don't know, but you need to forgive me because Jesus commands you to. <laughs> so though perfection is not required, you know what progress is. So we will accept each other with all of our messes on the sole basis of this because Jesus has accepted us with all of our messes. And again, that's who we're following and that's who we're wanting to be like. Very quickly, number two, the second thing, the second proper view of relationships is you need to know that relationships are costly. Relationships will cost you your time, your money. It'll cost you your feelings because time will come when your friends let you down. It'll cause you some heartache because when they suffer loss or experience tragedy, all of a sudden you're hurting and you're crying too. I mean, I have laughed with Christians to the point of of crying, and my gut hurts, I'm laughing so hard. And other times, I've literally cried tears of pain. And both things together create such a powerful sense of unity and oneness that God desires. And for each one of you, when you achieve great things in your life, you need people to celebrate that with. And when you experience heartache, you need others to come alongside you and cry with you. And the cost of letting yourself become a true friend creates such an atmosphere in your heart that's healthy. It's that feeling of being connected. That feeling gives you such a great sense of fulfillment because you were created by God to exist in friendships. So make no mistake about it, guys. Relationships are messy and they are costly. And if that sounds too scary for you, then ponder this. Messiness and cost are no strangers to Jesus Christ. It cost him and it was messy. But for you, it was worth it. So now as a response, we say for you, you're worth it. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, denying yourself is costly and taking up a cross is messy. But if you want to follow him and that's what we're wanting to do, then cost and mess should be something that's worth sacrificing. It's worth the cost. It's worth the reward. When we get to heaven, it's going to sure be worth the reward. Amen? So if any of you today are thinking, okay, this is great. I would love to start building some some good friendships, some better friendships with people. Where do I begin? I'll give you four things. This is where you begin. Number one, a community group. Community groups are biblical. They're designed for you to be in a home with other people, just eating Starting to learn other people's lives. Being with other people. They're huge. Secondly, to serve alongside other people. You know, you, you, you might walk around and be like, man, there's some ladies who really know each other well. And man, there's some guys. They probably went to high school together and they just like come to church and I could never be that. And it's like, no, that's not true. What happened is these men and women started coming at seven in the morning serving or they stayed later after church or they got involved in children's ministry. And when you serve God next to someone, something, I can't even describe it. It's supernatural and powerful. Something happens where it connects you together. Because 
you, you see their heart is to serve Jesus and it just melts you for them. And you become connected and, and that's what happens. You, you just, you see all these great friendships and it's because they decided to give up their time and to serve God. And when you do that, you meet some really great people with great hearts. Community groups, serving alongside others. Thirdly, attend events. You know, there's, there's dudes just in this room I'm getting to know a lot better just because of the men's retreat we have. It's like I see, I see them more. I see their faces. I can pick them out better. And it's great. And, you know, we have this sack lunch Sunday coming up the 23rd. That's an opportunity. The, the ladies retreat. To attend these events, you just rub shoulders with people, and that's how you get to know others. And then fourthly, you know, we, we live in a digital world today. And so be connected digitally. You know, if you, if you haven't liked our Facebook page or joined us on Instagram, do that. Because that's just how people connect these days, isn't it? I mean, are any of you on Marco Polo? Raise your hands if you're on Marco Polo. Anyone? Like f- 10 of you. Okay. It's really cool. Get it. It's like, it's like leaving a voice message for someone, but it's like, you can see my face. And whenever I call, I always have my boys like say, hi. They're like, hi, Eddie, or whoever it is. You know, and it's like, I don't know, maybe it's not your thing, but <laughs> Marco Polo is like, it's really cool. My, my buddy Keith Fortenberry, he's pastoring a church in Heidelberg, Germany. His wife is Turkish. And they took like a week vacation to Turkey. And he just Marco Poloed me. The first thing when I woke up at four this morning is like Keith Marco Poloed me. And he's sitting like on the Aegean Sea in this place I've never been to. And he's like eating this meal right on the ocean. He's like bragging. And he, he goes, America. <laughs> He's like, Europe, you need to get over here. And it's just, I don't know, it's kind of cool. We're connected digitally. So joint, you know, on Facebook, there's a, there's a Calvary Canyon Hills families group where I see people chatting back and forth. And when you get plugged into a community group, there's Facebook pages, and you just get plugged in that way. So, you know, I hope today has spoken to you. The band, you guys can come forward. Whatever it is. Whatever it was, just take this time to reflect. What has God spoken to your heart today? It could be about being a better friend, realigning your expectations about friendships, getting over bitterness from the past, maybe you forgiving someone. Bitterness, it is like drinking poison, wishing it would kill someone else. Bitterness will destroy you. You got to let go. You got to forgive. You got to surrender. And Jesus is the cure. He is the answer for all of that.